All right, welcome. I'm John Schwartz, the Dean of the College of Public Service. Great to see everyone in here and on Zoom. Uh, real briefly, I wanna say uh, it's great to be at UHD. Uh, we are the second largest university in Houston. We're the most diverse university in Texas and in the Southern region. And you're in the College of Public Service. We have social work, education, and criminal justice. And really proud of the difference we're trying to make in Houston. And really excited to have an alumni come back and talk to you about his experience and what brought him here. So thank you very much. And I'm going to introduce our center director, Mr. Villano, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dean Schwartz. Welcome, everybody. Uh, and welcome, everybody online. And welcome, those folks of you who are in the room here. Um, I wanted to um, tell you how this happened. So uh, Liza Alonzo, um, our colleague here in the, in the university, she came to me and we were talking and she told me that she knew Mike. And um, so Mike came and we had a visit and I, I, I was just really fascinated by, by what he was sharing. And his, what really struck me was just, I know I've, I used it in the advertisement, but it was his non-conformist approach to life. Um, and this was back in the 80s, right? So this was when nonconformist wasn't really as nonconformist as it is now. Um, it was nonconformist in the 80s compared to the 60s probably, but still, it was just different. And I thought, you know, that, that probably is gonna resonate with our students because our students, their paths are different. My path was different. Uh, it's, it's just not conventional. So um, I wanted to bring him on, but first before I, I, I tell you a little bit about Mike, I want to let you know that this year for Vital Voices, we had 11 presentations, three in the fall, eight in the spring, and several of our issues of our presentations focused on trauma and grief, because a lot of people have been dealing with that during this, the past two years with the pandemic. We had Dr. Suzanne Pritzker from the University of Houston. She spoke on the history of voting rights in the United States. We had Congressman Troy Nels. Um, do a vital alumni event. Uh, he, he represents the 22nd Congressional District. Uh, we had Dr. David Klinger come in October uh, to do a talk on reducing, how to reduce deadly violence and police, in deadly force police usage, violence usage and policing. We had David Garlock in February. He, is, he was a death row inmate and um, um, he was uh, convicted of murder and he was released and he came and talked about um, special populations, reentry, and restorative justice. That was a really fascinating presentation. Uh, and then we had Dr. Julie Kaplow do a presentation on trauma and grief and how it affects children and youth uh, in the educate and in, in how, how we educate our children. She's actually coming back to talk about how trauma and grief uh, can be a better understood by social workers and criminal justice who deal with youth. Um, in February, we had a, a professor from India, Dr. Prince Solomon, who spoke on uh, modern day slavery, social work and the caste system in India. Uh, and then in March, we had our first ever, uh, what we call Commerce Colloquium. It was an event where we had five local area superintendents come and talk about uh, their schools, about the differences the, um, in education, uh, policies and practices, how, how educational policy and practices affect the classroom. And then we had a special guest from the Department of Education, uh, Beatrice Seha Williams. She was, she is the uh, division director for Hispanic serving institutions, one of which we are. Uh, she came and she spoke at that event. And then a couple of weeks ago, we had Dr. R Ruth Lopez and Dr. Ra Rhoda Freeland uh, talk about engaging families and communities in the education process. And as a result of that, we are gonna, we're trying to put together a conference here in the fall to how, how non-dominant uh, families can better educate their students. Uh, not educate, can better uh, create a sense of community and how schools can better accommodate uh, non-dominant families in the education process. Um, so all that leads us to, we also, actually, last week, we had our Social Work Person of the Year presentation, and that we're, we honored Dr. Peter uh, Hotez and Dr. Maria Elena Botazzi. Uh, they have developed a low cost, well, it's a free vaccine that they're giving out, but it's low cost to develop. It's a dollar or 50 a dose. And it was really a fascinating uh, conversation because 
you know, the pharma companies, are not to say that they're all about profit, but you know pharma companies, right? They, they want to make money. And they developed this so that it could just be sent out to, especially to poor countries in the world without the cost that the regular pharmaceuticals produce. That, that was really, it was a very interesting presentation. And that leads us back to Mike Knox. So I knew that once I talked to him a couple of months ago that I wanted to have Mike Knox speak. And let me just tell you a little bit about Mike Knox. I was told not to say a lot because he's going to tell you himself. But he's a native Houstonian with a degree, with a degree both from the Houston Community College and here, University of Houston downtown. He is a former Houston police officer and author of and consultant on street gangs and youth violence. Wait till he tells you about that one. Mike was elected to office in December of 2015 as a Houston council member, and he took office in January of 16. He is a firm believer that good government requires good judgment, common sense reason and logic and he works daily to represent the citizens of houston and help guide the city with those basic principles in mind so without further ado councilman thank Mike you Knox. very much steve i appreciate that welcome everybody got to get a little enthusiasm going on now i'm following all this grief counseling stuff i don't know what that's about well, but you're not grief that's why yeah i'm not grief i believe to lighten it up life is fun and you got to have a good time and i think you're going to discover that in my lifetime I've, I've, I feel often a lot like Forrest Gump. Anybody seen that movie, Forrest Gump? You know, I just kind of bump along and stuff happens and some of it's good, some of it's bad, but in the end, it's all good. You know, it all works out in the end. So a little bit about my background. I am a native Houstonian. In fact, during the campaign, one of my opponents kept talking about his, uh, his wonderful story about coming to this country as a young child and all that Houston did for him and his family and la da da on and on and on. And so uh, one day I got tired of hearing about that. So I stood up and I said, I came to this country wearing nothing at all. I came without clothes, without money, without anything. I was born over here at Methodist Hospital in 1958. That makes me an old guy. It does. Can't help that. But the thing is, that I've lived here all of my life, except for the period that I went to South Dakota to serve our nation in the foreign country of South Dakota for four years in the Air Force. But I got back here as quickly as I could uh, because there's snow up there. Have y'all experienced snow? Let me tell you, it's fun to play in, but you don't want to live in it. I can promise you that. And I got back here. In fact, I promised my wife, I made her, I didn't make her, but I asked her to, to join me up there. We were high school sweethearts at the time, and I said, hey, why don't you come up here? It'll be fun. You know, come on up. It'll be a lot of fun. We'll get married and, you know, and just have a good time. I didn't tell her about the snow or about the cold temperatures or about nothing out there in the prairie but wind and all of that, and she made me promise when we came home we would never, ever again live where there is snow. So that means I'm limited to living anywhere in Texas south of Conroe. So anything south of Conroe, we're okay for the most part. At any rate, a little bit about my, uh, my schooling. I grew up here in Houston. As I said, I went to Anderson Elementary School, went to Fondren and to Johnston Middle School. Actually, I went to Johnston first. Then they redistricted our school district, and I ended up at Fondren. Uh, and I went from Fondren to Westbury High School, where I discovered that I was really bored. Uh, I decided that I was smarter than everyone in that building, including the teachers. I knew the answers to questions that had not even been asked yet. So in the 11th grade, I decided I've had enough of this, and so I left. I took a GED and joined the United States Air Force. And I spent four years up there, um, four years in the Air Force, and I realized at that point that maybe my parents were right about that college thing after all. It, it came about one day I was talking to a second lieutenant about some issue that she had a she had an opinion about that I knew was wrong, but I couldn't argue with her because she was a lieutenant and I was just a sergeant. I'm like, hmm, you know, the only thing different between me and her, because I was older than her, and, uh, but she had a degree and I didn't. I went, oh, well, that might be something. So um, uh, started, I took a few college classes there in South Dakota and you know, I knew I wasn't going to be there very much longer, so I was kind of halfway doing it. But I came home and uh, got a job with the Houston Police Department, spent 15 and a half years on the Houston Police Department. And while I was doing that, I decided, uh, uh, you know, I'd kind of put my education on hold for a while and, 
you know, getting settled in my new job, learning how to be a policeman. And by that time, uh, we were thinking about having babies and all that kind of stuff. And by the way, my son, before he passed away, told me, he said, Dad, thank you so much. Thank you so much for waiting to have me until we were born in Texas. It was important that he was a Texan all the way through. But in any, any event, so we, uh, I'm hanging around, uh, you know, just tooling along, learning my job as a policeman. I spent time in patrol. I spent time in the dispatch division. I spent time back in patrol. Then I went to juvenile division and then out to the west side. So during all that time, I decided, you know what, I'm pretty... And getting pretty good at this policing thing. I think I'm just going to go to school now. So I started at the Houston Community College and uh, worked my way through. And then about that time, where I was almost done with the community college, uh, we had a new mayor in town named Catherine Whitmire. And Catherine Whitmire, the mayor of our city, decided that it was important to balance the budget by cutting police pay by 3%. Well, I didn't I couldn't find any other way to get my 3% back, but the HPD had a deal that if you had a college degree, you could get a 3% pay raise in your, in your paycheck for having that college degree. So I didn't go to school because really I wanted to be educated or anything like that. I just wanted more money in my paycheck. And so uh, I started going to school on duty. Well, not on duty. Of course, you can't do that. Uh, but I, would, I was working as a policeman and having to support my family and go to school at the same time. So I, I completed my degree at the Houston Community College, a two-year degree in, in a, Associate of Arts of General Studies. Um, and then I transferred that over to the Houston, University of Houston downtown campus. And about three years later, I uh, got a degree in, um, in General Studies. Y'all know what that means, right? It means I know a, lot, a little bit about a lot of stuff, but not a lot about any one thing. And uh, it got me my 3% pay raise, and I was really appreciative of that. And so I was back to zero. I was back to where I should be. So that's the brief story of where I've been. And in the interim, um, we, I'm going to sit down for a little bit. Can everybody see me okay? Uh, just because I've had a long day, and I'm tired. So I'm going to sit down a little bit, and we're just going to talk about things. Now, I've glossed over a lot of, lot of issues, but there's a lot of problems along the way, and there was a lot of obstacles that I had to cross over, and there's a lot of things that I had to do to get where I am today. And none of it uh, was really by design or, or by uh, other than just, you know, trying to make good decisions along the way. Everything I did, I tried to make good decisions. I can tell you that when I was in high school, I was not a very good student. You know, because I was kind of bored. I thought it was boring to be in school. So I, I really didn't pay that much attention. That sounds like, you know, if you're that bored and you're that smart, you should be able to make straight A's with no problem. But the thing is that it didn't intrigue me, didn't interest me. I was re looking forward to getting on with my life. So I was a, a moderate student at best. I made B's and C's mostly, a couple of D's here and there. Everyone once in a while throw in an A on something, you know, and then occasionally I'd fail a class. I, I, I do remember... Um, having to go to summer school one year in middle school, and that told me that I needed to keep up at least enough to pass because I didn't want to blow out my summers with that. So during high school, you know, I was a normal high school bad boy, you know, smoked cigarettes and hung out at the, in the smoking area at the school. I don't know that they have those anymore. Don't think so. No? No smoking areas in school? Definitely not. Yeah, because that's bad for you nowadays, you know. But back in the day, that was a big thing. All, the, all of us got together, petitioned the school. We promised to riot if we didn't get it and all that kind of stuff. So that was me. I was, I was in that crowd. And, and uh, so finally I got around to, uh, you know, deciding that, hey, of course at home, uh, my father was a, a functional alcoholic. You know, he was a salesman. and You know, he would get drunk and say stupid stuff and do stupid things. Got a little violent occasionally. My mom was kind of an enabler. She loved us all, and I know that. But... But uh, she also, you know, didn't know what to do besides be married to my dad. So she tolerated a lot of that stuff. So the, the home environment really wasn't that good for me. And, and, the, um, and I just decided that if I stay here, I'm going to go to prison or something. I mean, the friends I was hanging around with, the things I was doing, uh, I'm just very lucky I never got caught at anything that I was doing because I just piddled in it. You know, I didn't really commit to it full time. But at any rate, uh, some of my friends... Um, did end up in prison. Some of them ended up dead. Some of them ended up, uh, you know, with some serious injuries and illnesses along the way. But at any rate, 
So at about 16 years old or so, I decided, well, I'm, I need to quit. I need to go somewhere else and do something. My 17th birthday was coming up, and I um, um, asked my parents if they would sign to send me to the military, and they're going, oh, heck yeah. Yeah, we'd love to have you get out of here. That's great, you know. Take a lot of load off of us, all this. You know, I, I've got to tell you, a lot of people get worried when they get called to the principal's office. I had a chair with my name on it in the principal's office. So I wasn't a very good student, and I, and I, at 17 years old, I decided, you know what, I just need to start my life and get on with it. So I got my parents to sign me up for the military, and I went to the military and went through basic training, and I got an awakening there. Basic training was a lot of fun, but I'll never do it again. I like to tell people the military was the best mistake that I've ever made in my life. Um, realizing what I realize now, I should have taken my GED and gone straight on to college. But honestly, I wasn't prepared to go to college because I was still in that rebellious little mindset thing going on. So in the military, I learned to be a man. And one of the things I learned about being a man is, and I tell this to kids when I talk to them about the gang stuff, some people, I'll ask people this. In fact, I'll ask the audience, what, what, how do you know when you stop being a boy and you become a man? Does anybody know that? Nobody? You want to hazard a guess? How do you know when you stop being a boy and you become a man. It's very simple. It's when you stop making decisions based on what you want, but how those decisions are going to affect those you love around you. So that applies to women too, by the way. You, you stop being a girl and you start being a woman when you start thinking about how your actions impact others. And I, I learned that in the military uh, because, you know, we all were in there together and we had to take care of each other. And if one of us messed up, it impacted everybody in the squad. So if one of us messed up, we all got punished for it. And so that's one of the things I learned in the military. So I'm in the military. I'm in South Dakota. I'm securing our nation's, uh, our, our nation's ballistic missile system, the Minutemen II missile system. And um, I'm dealing with officers. They're coming up and down out of the hole. I don't, are you, anybody here familiar with Minutemen missiles? Okay, so what they are is they have a launch facility where all the missiles are launched from, but the missiles are a long ways away and maybe 10, 15 miles around in a big circle. There's 10 of them per launch facility, or there were at the time. It, as it turns out, I've discovered I'm a dinosaur. I'm no long, my job no longer exists in the Air Force because we've gotten rid of all of our ballistic missiles, and now we depend on crews and other kinds of delivery systems. But um, but at any rate, at the time, I'm, I was, I'm out there dealing with all these officers and all these other people, and, and I grew up in the ranks and got to be a sergeant. Now I'm in charge of an entire response team and, uh, and that sort of thing, and I'm like, I don't know, I was 20 by then. Uh, at 21, I'm looking for something to do, and I decided, well, Oh, this is the other thing. When I went to join the Air Force, <laughs> this is what I learned. There's, there's lies of commission and lies of omission, okay? The military, does a, they're good at lies of omission. When I went to join the military, I, I decided I wanted to be, when I decided on the Air Force, I wanted to be a policeman, you know, because I thought that'd be cool. And uh, he said, okay, well, we'll sign you up as an SP. That's what we call our policemen in, in the Air Force is security police. I said, oh, okay, great. He showed me a movie that was about 80% law enforcement, 10% flight line security, and 10% missile security. But what he, doesn't, what he didn't tell me is that there was two AFSCs in the, in the Air Force regarding police. There's an AFS uh, 3011 and a 010 or something. I don't know what it was. He needed people in the security part of the, uh, for his quota for that month. He already filled up his law enforcement, his LE part, and, and so he needed SP and convinced me that, okay, this is what you're going to do. So I didn't discover that till I finished basic training and I got my orders and I discovered that I was guaranteed job as a security police in missile security. <laughs> what, but, but wait, I wanted to be the police. Oh, no, no, this is what you signed up for. You should have read all the material. <laughs> so when I started to realize maybe I didn't know as much as I thought I did. At any rate, so I did that. It was all fun, and we got, you know, we had a good time. I can tell you that the, when I arrived in Ellsworth, South Dakota, after basic training, 
When I arrived there, it was May, and um, I went to bed that night, and when I woke up the next morning, there was eight inches of snow on the ground. Now, remember, I'm from Houston, and we've already cut the grass like 10 times by May. There's no chance of any snow in in Houston in May, and I thought I had slept till December and uh, found out that was just overnight, so I was like, oh, my goodness. So what I decided to do then was I, I went and um, went down to the base headquarters after I checked in, and I, I volunteered to, for a remote extended to extend my career another two years and travel anywhere else other than where I was at because I thought, man, if it snows eight inches in May, what does December look like? I don't know that I want to do that. So uh, the Air Force evidently has some sort of device that they use that they can tell you know, so that they sent me, I sent my application in, they ran it through, they discovered that I was in some trauma, so they decided to keep me there, and they sent me back an 18-month freeze notice, which basically says, don't bother us in, for 18 months. You're stuck there for 18 months. Come see us again after that. Well, the 18 months went by, and after about a year, I, got, I came home and got married to my sweetheart from high school, and, and we moved up to South Dakota together, and Life was good, and everything was going along just fine, and, and uh, a lot of my friends started getting girlfriends up there and forming relationships and whatnot, and they started volunteering to stay at the base. And so then they started getting shipments to Turkey and Germany and England. Every time the Air Force thinks you're happy, they'll, they'll move you somewhere, right? But evidently, they have some device that they run these applications through, because I really wasn't happy up there and neither was my wife, and we wanted to get back to Texas or somewhere else. So I put in an application to, you know, to change my, my location, and they ran it through this machine. Evidently, there's a pressure detection system or something, and they can tell if you're really happy with your pin strokes or you're just faking it because they knew I was faking it. And so they sent me back a notice and said, oh, guess what? You're going to be there until you're done, until you reenlist. So we had to make a home up there, and, and we just did what we had. So I, was, I became trailer trash. I was a, uh, we owned a mobile home uh, because we didn't want to live on base. So I lived in a mobile home, a, a 14 by 80 foot mobile home uh, was our first home. We drove an old beat up station wagon that, that uh, Helen had brought with her from her, her dad had given her that as a wedding present. And it, it carried us up there with all of her stuff. Um, the first, week that we stayed on our honeymoon to the last possible second. We drove 24 hours straight to get to South Dakota. And I had a a small mobile home there that I'd already leased for a couple of months. And so we stayed in that one. And the very next morning I went uh, to work and was gone for three days. A blizzard came through. She was alone in that that mobile home with a dog for two weeks because I couldn't get back. The snow was so deep. They had to had to wait for the storm to go away so they could fly helicopters out to pick us up. This was funny. She called me up one, one evening while it was snowing like that, and she says, there's a lot of snow around here. And I said, oh, yeah. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you before I left, you need to open the door periodically, uh, clear out the snow off of the front porch. Otherwise, it'll pile up there on the door, and you won't be able to get out. She goes, well, why would I want to do that? And I said, why would I want to leave? I'm, I'm not going anywhere in the snowstorm. I said, oh, well, you need to get out and check, a, a check to make sure the snow drifts don't come up over the trailer and block the exhaust system uh, for the heater because you might die of carbon monoxide poison if you don't do that. So she said, oh, my goodness, I better start doing that right now. So she, we hung up the phone, and a few minutes later she called back, and she says, I can't open the door. What do I do now? I said, oh, well, is it you can't open it, or is it just like frozen shut or what? He said, I think it's frozen shut. I said, okay, go get the hair dryer and heat up the door handle and open the door. And so she did that, and she cleared the porch, was walking around all night long. You know, while the storm was going on, she's, every few hours she was going out, walking around, checking everything. Um, this was not, she said, she said this to me, I did not sign up for this crap, okay? I just want you to know I did not sign up. One of the best things that happened to us was we moved 2,000 miles away from home because at that time we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So if you wanted to call somebody, it cost you money. You had to call long distance. And those long distance calls were expensive. So we only called on Sunday evening because that was the cheapest time. So the only time she could talk to her mom and dad and complain about me was on Sunday 
after five o'clock in the evening. You know, by that time, we had worked it out and got back to being friends and so forth. So we learned to depend on each other during that time. So after the military was over, I came back, got on the Houston Police Department, and uh, basically did basic training again, um, you know, with all the running and physical activities and all that. And then uh, had my career there. Um, my partner and I, after I'd been on for quite a while and was in the process of getting my degree, we decided to start the first gang unit in the city of Houston, and that was in 1988. Now, my partner and I had been working together in juvenile division, juvenile investigations, uh, for some time, and at that time, the city of Houston had decided to do some experimental work with law enforcement, and they were looking for new ideas. And one of those things was decentralizing investigations to bring them back out into the neighborhood. And so we just opened the West Side Command Station on the west end of town, and then, um, and so they took two investigators from every discipline in the department. Two from robbery, two from homicide, two from auto theft, two, it was like the ark, you know? It was like Noah's Ark, just the two by two by two, we came to Westside. And they selected myself and my partner from the juvenile division to go out there. It wasn't long before we discovered this gang thing. So my partner and, my, and I were sitting around talking at lunch one day about, about this gang thing. I kept getting reports about this gang activity, and he had some reports about gang activity. So we decided that, well, we could take care of all the gangsters in Houston three or four days a week. We could probably start our own gang unit. We could establish our own hours. We could take care of those gangsters three or four days a week. And then, you know what? We could go play golf somewhere on duty and no one would know. You know, how bad can it be? So we, the problem was the department wasn't willing to spend any money to get us educated and trained. And before we pitched this idea, we needed to make sure that we, had, we were the only ones in the department qualified to hold that position. So we started taking vacations and we would go to Los Angeles and San Diego and Chicago and New York at various gang trainings and <clears throat> things like that. So we had all of our documentation, we did all of our research, we pitched the idea and the uh, Betsy Watson, who was the assistant chief at the time, blessed it and we started our gang unit. And that was the last time that I saw my golf clubs. It didn't happen. We got so busy so quick uh, dealing with the gang stuff. And of course, over the years, uh, y'all may remember Bob Lanier, uh, Mayor Bob Lanier, when he, when he was running for office. Uh, we were at the west, out in the west side in the A-Leaf area, and he was doing a campaign appearance at, at a community meeting about gang violence and gang activity in the A-Leaf area. And so, of course, Mike Howard was there. He's my partner. I was there. Um, and Mike Howard was speaking, and he was going on about what we're doing, about the gang issues and all this. And so uh, Elise Lanier leaned that she was sitting next to me, and she said, who is that guy? Who's that guy speaking right now? I said, oh, that's Mike Howard. He's running for mayor. And her eyes got big, and she said, wait, he can't run for mayor. The, 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 the sign-up period's already over with. He can't possibly run for mayor. <laughs> She got all flustered. I said, I'm just teasing. That's my partner, Mike Howard. <laughs> yeah. So at any rate, so after he kept going on, and then Bob Lanier leaned over. He was sitting on the other side of Elise, and she, he leaned over to me, and he says, so, uh, officer, what, what do y'all need? What do y'all need to, to fix this gang problem? I said, well, we need at least four more officers. We need two or three cars. We need an office, and we need some support, some financial support from the department. Okay. So he gets up there and he does a talk, his little campaign speech, and he promises everybody in the room that if he's elected mayor, by golly, the west side of Houston is going to have a gang unit, fully functioning, fully staffed, ready to go to work, you know, when he gets to be mayor. So he wins and um, he appoints uh, Sam Nucci as the uh, chief of police. And Sam doesn't believe in the gang business. He doesn't think there's anything to it. And he doesn't want anything to do with it. And so months go by. About four or five months go by in the end of the mayor's first term, and he starts getting pressure from the community. Hey, hey, Bear, you made these promises. We've got you on video. We've got you saying you're going to do these things. None of these things has happened. And so uh, the mayor told Sam Nucci to make sure that happened, and Sam Nucci and I never became friends over it uh, the whole time that I was there. At any rate, so we, we struggled along through that. And meanwhile, the whole time we're doing this, I'm still going to school two or three days a week in the evenings. Uh, my teachers here and, and at HCC were very good about letting me be late from time to time. 
you know, I'm sorry I'm late. I had to finish putting this guy in jail, you know, I had to file paperwork. And so they were very generous about that. And uh, so the whole time we're doing all of this, I'm still going to school. And then, uh, uh, so we got our gang unit up and running. We're going well and everything's going good. And, and uh, so then I graduated from University of Houston downtown about 1990, something like that. And uh, I decided, well, you know, I did pretty good. I made all A's except for one, one D. I made a D in algebra. And I, and I had to blackmail my way to get the D. I told my algebra teacher, I promised I would not find any cocaine in his car on the last day of school if I could just pass algebra. Um, I did actually say that. I was teasing at the time, and we had a good relationship. But uh, he did help me along and made sure that I passed algebra. That was my very last course. I saved it for the end because I knew it would be the toughest. But I had all A's, a few B's mixed in. I became a great student, and I discovered that when you're paying for it, you're paying attention to it. And so it became a value to me. And so after I completed that, I decided, you know, I kind of like the I kind of like this education thing. Maybe I'll go to law school. So I took the LSAT and uh, passed. I, I did scored well enough to get, be invited by uh, South Texas College of Law to join the class. Well, by that time I'm like 38 years old, right? 38 years old, just graduated a college. Uh, thinking about going to law school, and I got to think, well, I'm 38 years old. I got a five-year-old at home, I've got um, weekends off, I've got four weeks paid vacation every week, I've got all the accumulated overtime that I can acquire, I'm getting paid overtime, I control my own hours. I think, and if I graduate, it'll take me at least three years, to, or maybe four years to graduate law school, in which case I'll be 40-something, a baby lawyer, working 70 to 80 hours a week in some dungeon doing research for some law firm, Hmm, I think I'll stay where I'm at. So I did. I stayed where I was at. Um, ended up that uh, I decided at some point I needed to write a manual because I wasn't going to be on the police department forever. I needed to write a manual about dealing with gang stuff. <laughs> so I sat down and wrote a manual and submitted it to, to this friend of mine who's a, who is an um, editor. And she said, you know what, Mike, this would be a good book. You know, um, if you take all the jargon out of it and you do these things, this would be a good book. You could probably get this book published. So I did. I, in 1995, I, I got a book published called Gangsta in the House, Understanding Gang Culture. And it had a, and, I'm, and when I was, at, those, at that time, you couldn't self-publish. You know, you couldn't go online and just put a book out there. You know, you had to actually find a publisher willing to do that. And so I did and that was in Michigan, I had to go travel up, but I made sure and go to Michigan in the summertime, not in the wintertime. I got my publisher, they published my book, and I had lots of fights with them over the cover. They wanted to put a brick wall and spray painted graffiti with a title, you know, and I said, no, 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 don't do that. Nobody will buy that book. Nobody will even read that book. What we need is Beaver the Cleaver's house on the front of this book, you know? We need some really nice house because gangsters are everywhere. They're not just in low-income communities. They're not, that's the whole point of the book. So I fought with them tooth and nail. I finally put this really nice picture of some house somewhere in America um, on that cover with the crime scene tape across the top, across the front. It says, Gangsta in the House, Understanding Gang Culture. So that book went well. It was received well. It won a couple of awards. And at that, at that time, uh, by that time, I was working heavily in the union, uh, police union. I was a board member. I was, um, I was uh, the editor of our union newspaper. And because um, I, I enjoyed writing. Uh, I'll come back to the writing story in a minute. I had one teacher that was just amazing here at University of Houston downtown. But um, so I wrote this book, and, and I realized that, wait a minute, I might, this could be like a career. I mean, I could go around helping a lot of people on this gang stuff, not just the people in Houston, but wherever. And the book would, would offer me a credibility, if you will, um, and become an expert in this field. And so maybe I should think about doing that. So I had a meeting with the chief of police 
Sam Nucci, and I said, hey, chief, uh, I've written this book. If you don't mind, I'd like to take a year off without pay, just, you know, uh, to go and explore the possibility. And he looked at me across the table. He said, well, Mike, let me tell you this. If I let every policeman who wrote a book have a year off, uh, then I wouldn't have any policemen around here. So you have to decide if you want to be a policeman or you want to be an author. Now, it didn't hurt that I was the editor of the Union newspaper and was notorious for editorials in which I would intentionally misspell Sam Nucci's name. I would spell it Sam Nucci and imply that he was some gangster thug when it come to discipline for all of our union members and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, we weren't really all that good of friends. So I had to pray about it a lot and had to think about it, talk with my wife, and we decided, you know what? In 10 or 15 years, when I look back on this, if I, decided, if, if I decide to stay, I will always wonder, would it have made a difference? And so I took a leap of faith, and I left the police department in 1995 after I got my book published and went and became an entrepreneur. I became a, a self-employed consultant. You know what that means? I was unemployed. And one of the things I didn't know when I left the police department was that it's important to answer the phone. Because when I was a policeman and would get my cases in, people would call wanting to know about their cases and that. And I would respond to them when it was convenient for me because I'm busy working a lot of cases. I used to get, when I was at Westside, we were doing gang cases, I used to get 10 to 15 cases every day. And those were after they'd been culled by the supervisor. And he's just looking for solvability factors. And every, every investigator in that office got 10 to 15 cases every single day. Uh, that was our caseload. So, you know, answering, in fact, I had an answering machine I got in trouble over, talk about nonconformist. You know, people would call the Houston Police Department with my phone number and they'd get this message. You've reached the office of Mike Knox. I'm out busy fighting crime and suppressing evil, making the streets safe for women, children, and orphans. Please leave your number and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Well, one of these days, one of my supervisors called me up and I wasn't there and he got that message and well, I had to change the message. So I'll just say that. In any event, so you know that you can't call the other police. But there's no competition in law enforcement. When the case is assigned to you, it's not like somebody can call a different police department to investigate that. So you're pretty much operating, you know, as a, there's no, no other choice. But when you get out in the free market world, there's a lot of gang experts out there. There's a lot of other people that can do what you do. And if you don't answer your phone, you starve to death because when you get around to it, they've already found somebody else. So it didn't take me long to figure out that I needed to start answering my phone. So I did that. I almost starved to death for two years. But finally, got, I got the hang of it. And I started working all around the United States and Canada. And I ended up spending 20 years on the road, um, uh, flying in airplanes and going to places. And it sounds really exotic, but here's my itinerary. I'd leave Houston, go to the airport, get on the airplane, fly the airplane to, let's say, Vancouver, Canada. Get off the airplane, be met by my, my, uh, my client, who, by the way, was a funeral home, which is another, maybe we'll talk about that, I don't know. But it's a funeral home director. So they, they would pick me up from the airport and take me to the hotel. The very next morning, I would get up about 6 o'clock in the morning, and we'd go do a morning show a t television morning show or, tele or radio show um, to talk about them and them bringing me in and all the gang issues, blah, blah, blah. After that radio show, we would go to the first venue, which would be a middle school or a high school, and we'd do a program uh, for all three grade levels. And then we'd break for lunch, and, I, and they would take me from that venue to, uh, to a uh, rotary club or some other luncheon where I'd be the guest speaker and we'd do the whole thing again. And following that lunch, we would go back to the second venue, which would be another middle school or another high school, and um, and I would do three more grade levels there. And then at the end of the at the end of the day, um, we would have a teacher training for the two schools that I had been to that day, pick a location and go do those two school teachers. And then that evening, after five o'clock, sometime around six thirty or so, uh, we would have another venue for all the parents and the public that wanted to hear. From me, So I worked, and, and by that time we were done, it was probably 10 o'clock at night, uh, my client would take me back from that last venue back to the hotel room where I would fall into bed and, and get up the next morning and do the same thing over 
and over again. So I've been to Vancouver a whole lot, and I've never seen the place, <laughs> except for the road to and from different things. So it sounds exotic, but it was a lot of work. And, but I did enjoy it. And so um, at some point, a few years back, I decided that I needed to work less and charge more. So I started doing that. I started I raised my rates. My clients, uh, some of them stayed with me. Some of them didn't. Uh, some of them decided that I've cost too much. That gave, left me more time to sit around and watch television. And then I started arguing with the TV about what's going on in city politics. My wife got tired of it one night, and she says, Mike, you know, you've been telling everybody all your life that um, if you have a problem, you need to bring a solution with you. If you're not willing to bring a solution, keep your mouth shut. He says, she said, I need you to either put up or shut up. I am so tired of listening to you talk about politics. So either put up or shut up. So I ran for office, and then I won. Looking back, I think she just wanted me to shut up the whole time. But the point of the fact is, I got involved in this business by accident. And what I've discovered is that our nation and our governments are hungry for people that believe in good judgment, common sense, reason, and logic. My decision to come to University of Houston downtown and the Houston Community College was not based on some academic desire to become educated in any particular field. It was a financial uh, thing that I needed to do to be able to support my family. And so I made that logical decision to get a college degree to do that. Um, my decision to operate a gang unit wasn't because I really cared about gangsters all that much. Initially, it was because I wanted to play more golf, for heaven's sake. But it worked out that it was fun, and I enjoyed doing it and all like that. So um, what I've discovered is that city government, when I, when I, in fact, when I ran my first race, a friend of mine called me up. He says, hey, man, I heard you're running for city council. Yeah. He said, what's your platform? Good judgment, common sense, reason, and logic. He goes, well, you're going to lose. And the longer I sit at City Hall, the, less, the, the more I realize that good judgment, common sense, reason, and logic has little to do with governance in today's um, you know, governing bodies, in the state, in the city, the county. You know, it's all about politics. And politics has become such a bad word now. But I want you to think about that for just a minute. Politics really is what you do every day. Uh, when you go to work, you dress in a certain way. Why? I mean, how many of you would hire the lawyer that looked like, you know, that dressed like a plumber, you know, with the butt crack showing and all of that? You're not going to hire that lawyer. That lawyer needs to be in a nice suit. How many of you are going to hire the plumber dressed in an Armani suit? Well, obviously, he's charging too much because he can afford that Armani suit. So there are expectations in everything you do. Um, and, and when we meet those expectations, we're successful. And when we don't, that's logical, Okay. It's impractical for a plumber to dress in an Armani suit. It's impractical for a lawyer to dress as a plumber. It's impractical to do, in fact, when you get up in the morning and you get dressed, you're preparing your political day. You dress in a way to present an image that you want people around you to see. There's nothing wrong with politics. What's wrong with governmental politics today is they're so focused on advantage. Who's got the advantage? Who's doing this and who's doing that? There's very little concern for how that benefits or doesn't benefit the communities that they serve. And so I spent a lot of time at City Hall arguing on those issues. And again, uh, you know, I, like I said, I didn't intend to become a politician. It just sort of happened that way. At any rate, that's the saga of Mike Knox. I see I've bored everybody here to tears. So uh, uh, I guess we can stop now and answer questions if you have any. Let's see if we have, do we have any online questions? No, okay. Um, do we have any questions from anyone here in the room? Hello. Yes, excuse me. Hi, how are Hi. you? Hi, I'm going um, well. So my name is Beth Gilmore, I'm assistant professor over in criminal justice. Okay. And this is not really a question, this is more maybe some advice or just words of encouragement. Uh -huh. So um, as you can tell, maybe from our student population here, we have a lot of working professionals um, in the field, right? So they're working those on call hours and they're really busy and they're doing a ton of things, right, all at the same time. And um, 
my question is, so being in that position yourself, a student who was working and had all this crazy stuff, is there any advice or maybe potentially words of encouragement you could offer to students now retrospectively? Oh, yes, actually. Um, in fact, I convinced several of my colleagues to go to school, uh, one of whom has a master's degree now, and another one is working on his PhD. And they started because they saw me doing homework on my desk <laughs> at, the, at the police station, you know. So, yeah, I mean, your, your involvement in education, there's a lot of things going on in your life. And but, uh, I guess what you have to do, unlike when you leave high school, you think you got to complete college in four years and then go out and start your life. When you, when you do it the other way around, when you're already working, and you're, it's okay to take your time. It, it doesn't take, take what courses that you can uh, according to your schedule. Don't overload yourself so you can concentrate and make good grades on them. But uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether it takes you two years or four years or 10 years or 20 years. It just, it's that constant process of education that really opens your mind to other ideas and other uh, scenarios and other opportunities that you may not have recognized before. So it took me, um, it took me six or seven years to get a four-year college degree as opposed to four, but I was going, I was taking, you know, three classes or two classes at different semesters, just taking my time, getting it done. And so what I would say to everybody that's, uh, that's in that position is, don't worry about it. Just keep plugging away, keep taking one step in front of the other, you'll get to your destination, whatever that is, uh, at some point down the road. And it's fun. Yeah, oh, let me, let me just take this opportunity. I had a teacher, I can't even remember her name, but she was the most aggravating teacher I've ever experienced in my lifetime. She was an um, English teacher, and um, she had this grating voice. I mean, that would just, ooh, it was like, a, you know, nails on a chalkboard. I know y'all younger people in here probably don't know what a chalkboard is, but, <laughs> yo, it's just a terrible grating noise. But it was so bad that after a while it became endearing, you know, it was sort of charming. She was the epitome of the absent-minded professor. Often she would come to, to class wearing two different kinds of shoes, like two different color shoes or socks or whatever. Her, her shirt and all that, I mean, her just mismatched all the way. And when you went and visited her office, if you had the pleasure of doing that, it looked like some sort of uh, person who does a lot of uh, hoarding. It was a hoarder's office. There was there was no place to be. There was a trail that led from the door to her desk. And if you wanted to sit down, you had to move about 25 or 30 books off the chair and find another place to put them while you sit down and had a visit with her. And she, you know, but I say that, but, but she actually almost caused me to get a second degree in English uh, because uh, she invited me after we got done with our English stuff. She said, you know, Mike, I'm doing a, I'm doing a whole class on Shakespeare, and I'd really like for you to to participate in that class. I want you to come to my, and sign up for my class. And I said, really, Shakespeare? I'm a policeman, I don't care about Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah, I think, you'd, I think you'd really enjoy it. I think you can contribute to the class. So I did, and I went, we had a good time, and we studied nothing but Shakespeare for the entire semester. And at the, ten, the term paper at the end of the year was, we had to write a term paper about William Shakespeare. So I took the approach that William Shakespeare was a fraud. A fraud, now she loved William Shakespeare. She said, how can you say that? And so basically the, the theory is that, um, you know, that William Shakespeare was at best a, moder uh, a, a, a moderately good actor. He had no formal education. He had no connection to the royal court at all. And yet somehow he wrote plays that had a lot to do with royal court. In fact, he, his plays were so enlightening to the general public in England that the Queen of England put him in jail like three or four times. Well, at the same time this was going on, the, the Queen's uh, nephew, who was part of the royal family, who could not be a shapeshifter, in other words, he couldn't be an actor uh, and be buried in holy ground and all that, the best he could do was support the arts. So the theory is that this nephew wrote all the plays, but be, he couldn't produce them because then he would be a shapeshifter. So he contracted with William Shakespeare to sign all of them. And that's why he built uh, William Shakespeare's theater and this and that. So we went on for three weeks debating my term paper. I got an A in that class, uh, but she was really annoyed. We'd stop on mine and go do somebody else's for a while. Then she'd stop and come back and say, 
Let's talk about this again. Where do you get this information from? You know, so we went on and on and on, but we had a great time with her. And, and that's the kind of people you meet in, a, in an educational environment, somebody that can challenge you. And more importantly, you can challenge them back and have to defend your work. Um, and it was fun. And we had a good time doing that. Anyway, uh, throughout the course of my career, I, I came within two classes of getting a double major. I probably should come back and, and finish that. But I'm busy right now, so we're having fun. Any other questions? We have a question from online. Can yeah. you spend? Can you speak more about how gangs are not synonymous with low-income communities? Oh, I can do. How that do for you three navigate or four days. continued racism towards communities uh, towards communities of color related to gang violence? Well, well normally I charge about fifteen thousand dollars to do that, um, but I'll give you the short version. So it turns out street gangs, uh, street gang members are bright and intelligent young men and women. Uh, they've come to the point in their life where they decided that the system is against them. Uh, and they get that way because they're not experiencing success in the traditional sense. So, and it doesn't matter what color you are or what ethnic background or what socioeconomic strata you come from. Um, if, for example, I'll just give you an example of this. Occasionally, parents will try to encourage their children and say, Oh, well, you made a B-plus in this course right here. You know, your brother Johnny, he's making A's in that. Maybe he can, um, he can, you know, help you for the next grading period. Well, most people would think that is an encouraging kind of thing to do. But in the mind of a gangster or someone that's leaning toward being a gangster, what that means is my brother's better than me and I'm a failure. And so if you experience failure enough in your life, uh, perceived or actual failure, uh, then, then what happens is uh, you decide, you have two choices at that point. You can believe that you're a failure and there's no hope for you. Uh, but if you want to survive, it needs to be somebody else's fault. Let's face it, if there's no, there's no light at the end of your tunnel, that's why people kill themselves. Because there's nothing for them in the future. So if you want to survive, you have to have a survival mechanism. And that survival mechanism is you make your failure the fault of someone else. It's your overbearing parents. It's the teachers that don't like you because of the color of your skin or the, the cut of your clothes or what have you. It's the, 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 the police department that's always bothering you. It's the court system. It's everything. So at some point, a young person gets the idea that the whole system is designed to, pre to prevent their success. And then, then um, it's really kind of magical how this works. They simply reverse the paradigm. So good becomes bad and bad becomes good. So in other words, kindness, courtesy, compassion become weaknesses. Aggression, cruelty, brutality, these become attributes. Um, when I get in trouble at home or school or in the law enforcement community, those are not bad things for me anymore. Those are resume building opportunities. And so some kids get like this and they seek out others like them and they form bands of groups together that we call gangs. and. Um, and they encourage, you know, all this negative behavior that the rest of us see as negative, but they see as positive. So when you punish a gangster by sending him to prison, you're really building his resume. So we've got to find another way to do that. And uh, what I talk to people about is how to reach these young people um, and talk to them about the decisions they're making and help them understand that the promises made by a street gang can never be fulfilled. And because they're unfulfilled promises, they are lies. And I'm, I'm ha happy to, uh, we'll probably have to come back for another thing on that, because it's really, it's, it's a long drawn out uh, kind of thing. But there's three promises that every single street gang on the planet makes to its members. And if I were to ask you in this room and, and on the television audience, uh, um, if you thought you had anything really in common with the ordinary run of the mill, died in the wool, bandana flying, no bone walking, baggy pants wearing, gangster thug, my guess is I wouldn't get very many hands. But if I ask you this, how many of you want to be safe in the world where you live, work, and play? I'd get all the hands. Everybody be raising their hands. How many of you think that you'd like to have the respect of those around you? Oh, yeah. How many of you want to be safe in the environment where you live, work, and play? Um, these three promises are the promises that every single street gang makes. It's our challenge as adults to explain to young people in a way they can understand that a gang can never be like a family, um, they can never provide safety, and they can't um, gain you any real respect. And so uh, when I say that, that gangsters are in all walks of life, that's because it's a psychological condition 
by the way, that's been going on since we've had a country. I mean, I found evidence of gangsters all the way back to 1776, uh, where they had lantern gangs. Have y'all ever heard of a lantern gang? It was a bunch of young, disaffected youth who would hang around in the bushes. Back there, then they didn't have street lights or flashlights. They carried lanterns. And so these, these young thugs would sit around in the darkness and wait for people to walk home, and they'd jump out of the bushes and rob them at sword point or knife point or something because they didn't have ARs, 15s, and AK-47s and all that back then. So the only thing that's changed in the world of gangs, really, is the accoutrements and the equipment. The psychology has remained the same always, and never in the history of this country has anybody ever addressed the idea that you can, re can reach these gangsters and teach them how to use the system for their benefit. Um, you know. Anyway, I can go on for days about that, but uh, it's a lot more complicated than everybody thinks. Anybody else? I can't believe nobody's wanting to ask about policey stuff or city council stuff. Go ahead. So I'm that one. So in your position as a leader, how would you describe your style of leadership? What has been your most difficult challenge as a leader in your profession, both personally and professionally? Well, as a leader, my style is I like to tell the truth, uh, honestly. I get in the most trouble as a council member for telling community groups the truth. A lot of times there are things that I can do for them, and sometimes there are things that I cannot. And when I'm clear about that, I get a, I had one, one guy one time come up to me at a, after a, a community meeting. He said, Mike, I got to tell you, I, uh, uh, you make me uncomfortable. And I said, well, how am I making you uncomfortable? And he says, well, I have the impression you're telling me the truth, and, and I'm just not used to that with my elected officials. And I said, well, there's the problem right there. But you're right. I can't. I'm not a very good liar. I can't remember 20 minutes from now the lie that I tell you right this minute. And so it's always my best practice to tell the truth. And unlike the movie, A Few Good Men, anybody see that movie? Where Jack Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth. I believe you can. And you can make better decisions if you have truthful information. And I, and I trust the people of Houston to be able to make good decisions like that. And as a leader, that's a dangerous thing. Um, and so that's one of the, uh, my style of leadership is I'm kind of laid back and I don't get excited about things, but, but I tell you the truth. And if you want to know something about the city of Houston, I'm going to tell you the truth as I understand it and, uh, and we'll be frank and open with you. And people are, that's what we need more of in government, really. Um, Republican, Democrat, independent, whatever. Uh, we need people that are really have your interest at heart and, and, and that sort of thing. Personally, it takes up a lot of time. Look, this job pays, uh, it's Houston City Council member, I'm just going to average up, pays about $65,000 a year. And that's pretty good money. But honestly, I was making $150,000, $200,000 a year doing the gang thing. So it's a tremendous pay cut. Um, and I, I, I like to tell people this is the most time-intensive extra job that I've ever had, right? Uh, I spend, except for the COVID years, 20 and 21, or and now most of 22, except for the COVID years, we're starting to come back now. But prior to that, I would spend 60 to 70, sometimes 80 hours a week doing city business. And a lot of that was in the evenings and afternoons um, when people are off work and they want to have their community meetings. They want to have conversations with their council member. Um, of course, I'm only required to be at council on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, public session day, and then our agenda vote day. But if you want to do a good job for people, you have to be accessible. And so by doing that, it cut time with my family. Um, and I don't know if my wife thinks that's a good thing or a bad thing, but you know, we cherish the moments that we have together as a family because there's so few of them. Um, you know, during one, you're a public official and you're in the public eye. So that's, but being a leader, it, 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 there's a price to pay for everything and, um, you know, you're, you only have so much time in a day, and sometimes you come home too tired to listen to your wife's problems or you, your kids' problems or whatever, and, and you just got to say, you know what, can we talk about this tomorrow? And hope that tomorrow there's a break in your schedule, you know, so you can do it. So there's been some of that uh, going on. Now, I can tell you that my wife and I have just celebrated 45 years of wedded bliss, and we've never had a fight, ever. I get a lot of strange looks when I say that. It's how you define fight that's important, okay? As a policeman, 
my idea of a family fight involves bone showing or blood flowing. And we've had none of that. None of that. We've had a lot of arguments. We've had a number of disagreements. We've had the occasional agree to disagree. We've even had a few of, you know, let's talk about this when you're in a better mood kind of approaches. Uh, but we've never, ever had a fight. So despite all of those uh, trials and tribulations, the lack of time that I spend at home when I'm dealing with public issues, um, we've, we've been able to, and I, I credit that back to those, those years in South Dakota when we couldn't, she couldn't get mad at me and run home because it's a 2,000 mile drive to her daddy's house. So she had to stay and deal with it. I had to stay and deal with it. And we learned how to do those things over the years. We were married at six, by the way. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> we were, I am, well, every once in a while. Uh, I don't play much golf anymore. In fact, when I left the police department, I went looking for my golf clubs and um, I couldn't find them. So I asked my wife, I said, Helen, have you seen, have you seen my golf clubs? She said, well, they're on there in the garage. I said, well, no, they're not. She goes, oh, well, I guess somebody must have stolen them. And I said, that's interesting because the only thing missing out of the garage is my golf clubs. I, you sure you didn't sell them somewhere? Oh. So that's remained a mystery in our life. For, but I do have a new set, you know, got a better set this next time. But uh, I haven't played much because, you know, I'm telling you, working in the city, if you're going to do a good job as a city council member representing the entire city of Houston like I do, I spend a lot of time on the road driving back and forth. I bought a car when I first started. Uh, I bought a new car because my campaign, with well, the car I had while I was campaigning broke. So after I got elected, I had to get a new car. And I put over almost 200,000 miles in six years. Um, and every one of those miles has been within the city limits of Houston. So, you know, driving here and going there and visiting people and and helping them with their issues and concerns. That's the most rewarding thing, by the way. What does at large mean? At large has nothing to do with my waistline, just so you know. Um, at large means I'm elected by every person in the city of Houston, just like the mayor. In fact, the mayor and I have uh, discussions periodically. He likes to remind me that, that uh, he was elected by the entire population of Houston to lead us into the future. And I say, yes, mayor, you were. In fact, the same exact people that elected you also elected me. I know that to be true because the mayor and I consistently win at the same success margin. So quite literally, the same people that are electing the mayor are also electing me. And, I, and I'll tell a mayor, and the reason they do that is they, they do want you to lead us into the future, but they want me to make sure you do it correctly. And uh, so that's our relationship between me and the mayor. It's respectful, but, you know, look, I, I have a belief that every single elected official in the city council is at the same stature as the mayor. We are neither subordinate or superior to e each other. We were all elected to do specific jobs to help govern this city. The mayor has a role, that large council members have a role, the district council members have a role. Each of them are equal. So it does annoy the mayor sometimes when I call him Sylvester instead of Mayor Turner, uh, because I see ourselves as colleagues, not uh, superior subordinate. And that, by the way, is a problem on the council because the mayor does have so much power. You know, he controls the, the budget, he controls the money. If you anger the mayor and you're a district council member, he can pull the funding for that park project in your district and give that money to a road project in somebody else's district. And he can do that without council approval. So district council members annoy the mayor at their peril. At-large council members, though, you know, we don't have any CIP projects to worry about because all the CIP projects are ours. The mayor can't move the project out of the city. He can't move the money out of the city. And honestly, I don't mind if a park gets done or a road project gets done. So he can't use that as leverage against me, which makes at-large council members the only council members that are free to speak truth to power uh, at any one time. And I do that. I'm notorious for doing it. I like to tell people my, my primary job is to stir the pot and poke the bear and see what happens, you know. So um, I, I do take that seriously. Like I, when I see something I think's not right, I'm very vocal about it, and, and I, I call the mayor to account. He often has to do that publicly, and he doesn't like it when I do that, but we're still respectful of each other, um, both in public and uh, privately. 
So uh, although he and I have different ideologies, I do know that the mayor, as well as my other colleagues, have the same goal in mind, and that's to make Houston a better place than it was when we got here. Now, we just have different ideas about how to get that done. But, uh, and we have heated discussions occasionally, which are fun. Somebody asked me one time, aren't you intimidated when you know, the mayor yells at you? I said, well, no, because I happen to know that nobody on that council table is going to take a shot at me. When I was a policeman, no telling who was going to shoot at me. So am I intimidated by words? No, I'm not. In fact, I don't think it's possible to offend me with words. Uh, it's just not, because I know that if you say something stupid, well, then that's on you. That's not on me. But if I react to it, and get all wound up about it, well, then that's on me. So you can say whatever you want, do whatever you want, that's fine, but as long as you don't try to hit me with a stick or something, we're good, you know, a difference of opinion. But that's the kind of approach that I take uh, on council. It's annoying sometimes for some, but I enjoy it. Any other questions? What's next? Oh, <laughs> what's next? I don't know. I'm sorry? Yes, they, we, do, we still do have gang units. They're a little different than when I started. We started our gang unit as a, as a resource for other divisions. So we went out and gathered intelligence. We worked gang cases so that we could develop intelligence on gangs, and we shared that intelligence information with other de departments within the city of Houston Police Department. In fact, I solved a homicide one time by reading the newspaper. <laughs> they, they showed a drawing of a, a suspect and he had this uh, unusual knot on his forehead. So I called the homicide division. I said, hey, uh, would y'all like a photo spread? I think I know who that is. I, I can do a photo spread for you. And oh, that'd be great, you know. And I did. Now, they would have eventually got to this guy, but I saved him about three weeks worth of legwork. So we got the, uh, we got the photo spread up. We got the, the, the suspect identified, charged, and sent to jail. Uh, a lot quicker. So that's what we did originally. Now they're, they're more of response units. They respond to gang violence areas, and the focus really isn't on intelligence gathering as much as it used to be. But yes, they are still there. And Mike, by the I way... I have a question from online. Yes. Uh, first, they want to thank you for your service. City politics is intriguing, but can seem overwhelming for someone with no experience, even if you have a degree. What is your best advice for getting your foot in the door in uh, city in city and local government? Okay, well, the first thing you can do is I would get um, I would start getting active in your local party, whether it's a Democrat or Republican party or independent party, whatever it is. I'd start I'd start hanging out with these guys and, and getting to know, look, in Houston, maybe, on a good day, you know, 30, 40 percent of the voters will come to vote, okay? So you've got to learn to attract those voters. Uh, it would be nice if 100 percent of the people that were registered to vote actually voted, but more often than not, they don't. And so, um, you know, the, the people who vote are the people who elect the people that are going to govern your life for the next four years or eight years or however long. So I would say get involved in politics is is as easy as attending community function meetings, getting to be known, and do some, do some work in the neighborhood where you live. Um, you know, whether it's working at a pantry or doing something where you can have contact with e each individual. One of the things that I, enjoyed, I enjoy most about politics is actually the campaign, because I get to get out in the street and knock on doors. And In fact, my, my chief of staff has, is under instruction. Anytime you hear me complaining about being a city council member, I want you to remind me that I went door to door begging for this job, okay? And he does. Occasionally I'll get grumpy or whatever, and he'll say, hey, Mike, you don't, don't forget, you begged for this job. You worked hard to get it. Oh, you're right, you're right, okay. And so I get a better attitude. But the, the point is, just getting out in the community, doing what you can at your church or, or in, a, in a community group or... Uh, being taking an active role in the issues and concerns of your neighbors, that sort of thing. I would recommend getting involved with your political party affiliation, whichever that party is, um, because you're going to learn a lot more doing that, like working as a, a work in some campaigns. Go volunteer to work in somebody else's campaign and see how they're doing it. You can learn a lot by just observation. 
In fact, uh, uh, I, I have one young lady that, uh, that signed up for a local campaign, and she's like, man, that, that candidate calls me at 1230 at night, you know, to want me to do stuff. And, uh, and I said, well, you need to remember that the candidate is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they want you available whenever they want you, and they'll call you at whatever time it is because they're thinking about it right now. And that's why candidates toward the mid or late, uh, right before the election, they all look exhausted because they're not getting any sleep. They're dealing with all kinds of issues. I, I, I recommend everybody runs for office for something, at least once in their lifetime, because it is an eye-opening experience. It is a college degree in and of it by itself. I mean, running for office for anything, whether it's precinct chair or mayor or city council member or board me school board member, mud district, whatever it is. You know, if you really want to get involved in politics, pick, a, pick something you think you want to do and just run for it and see what happens. You'll learn a lot. You may not win the first time or the second time. But if you keep doing it, you get better and better and better, and then you can actually make a difference. Um, someone asked me one time, Mike, what is politics like in Texas? This is my Canadian friends. Mike, what is politics like in Texas? And I explained to him that politics in Texas is much like a knife fight inside a phone booth. Win, lose, or draw, you're coming out of there bloody. You better have some thick skin, and you better enjoy the pain, because it is painful. But in the end, if you win your seat, if you win your position, you have an opportunity to do more good than you ever thought possible. I came to office, um, you know, hoping to do what I can. And I find that I'm, I'm successful sometimes, I'm unsuccessful other times. But at the end, I really believe that my presence on council actually keeps us on the straight and narrow. I mean, you know, you get too many people of one mindset or another and you, and you drift and you go in, in, the, or in the wrong direction. Well, we need to be plowing straight ahead and moving forward. And uh, so I really believe that what I've done on council these past six years, and hopefully through the remaining two years that I have, uh, people will look back and say, well, you know, uh, thank goodness Mike Knox was around. Of course, I can tell you, on January 1st of 2024, I'll go from being a who's who in Houston to a who's he, just like that. And I'm okay with that, really. I mean, I'm really okay with it. Um, Somebody at about 9 o'clock uh, in the morning on January 1st is going to say, hey, you remember that council member used to be on Houston City Council, wore that cowboy hat all the time and had that mustache thing going on? Remember him? What was his name? Who's he? <laughs> that's what's going to happen uh, when you leave office. That's, that's the other thing. It's uh, so many elected officials forget this, that whatever power I possess as a council member is not mine. It's on loan from the people of Houston. And if I get to the point where I start throwing what I call swinging the council stick all the time because I think I'm all that, it'll just be taken away from me because it's not mine to begin with. And so I'm careful with that council stick and I'm careful how I use it and where I use it and, and that sort of thing. And I'm always, it took me, gosh, I don't know, about seven months to get used to the, to the term honorable Mike Knox because I always thought I was honorable before I got elected, right? But then I got to thinking, well, now that I'm a politician, my honorability is actually in question. So what these people are doing when they call me the Honorable Mike Knox, what they're doing is gently reminding me that as a politician, I should be acting honorably. <laughs> so now I'm okay with it. You know, you go to dinners or whatever, and they have a place met, Honorable Mike Knox or whatever. It's like, what? And finally, I, I realized that is a gentle reminder that as an elected official, I should be acting honorably. And I, I try to take that serious, and um, I don't take myself too seriously, but I do take the work that I do seriously. And I think that's the, I, I think the one thing that, that um, distinguishes me from other electeds in this area. Any other questions? No other questions. Okay. I just, um, I just wanted to take a moment. So, um, so being a faculty member in the College of Public Service, our students come here, right, because they have a drive to serve. And right. I think that, that that is a very unique quality 
and I think that it's one to be cherished and celebrated. Um, and I just wanted to just take a minute and just acknowledge your service. So um, your military service, we have a lot of veterans, um, military serving individuals within our student body, within our faculty, um, and then your time with Houston police and now also you know, working in local government. Um, you know, I think that people have a drive. And you mentioned your son earlier. Right. Um, you know, your son was a policeman. Um, he tragically lost his life. Um, and that, that loss was reverberated throughout our college. Um, I can tell you just from having um, Houston officers in my classroom at that time. Um, and so you come from a service-oriented family. And I think that that is extraordinarily honorable. Well, and I think that that drive is, is very important. And I think it's something, again, to be celebrated and to be cherished with care. And so I just wanted to take a moment to thank you well, um, for, your, for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. If y'all don't mind it, it, talking about my son, I, let me just tell you a couple of funny stories about him. You know, we're very proud of him, of course. Uh, but he had an unconventional childhood as well. And so um, he was in the sixth grade. You know, he was having some trouble in school. He went in, tr in trouble, but he was, like, not focused, you know. And he was sort of in, – in public education, you know, the teacher has to teach to the slowest kid in the class. And so he was getting bored like I was getting bored, and I recognized that in him. And so we, we gave him the opportunity to be homeschooled. Now, it's not homeschool like I sat down and taught him algebra because I'm not going to do that. But uh, we joined a homeschool group, and he ended up thriving under that. He became, he became uh, very interested in learning how to learn um, and all of that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, he was a better politician than I'll ever be. I, I've got to tell you that wherever we go in Houston or in the state of Texas, in fact, anywhere we go, Somebody always has, has a story where they've met my son. And so now it's got to the point when we're at a restaurant or somebody and the waiter or some other person in the restaurant says, oh, you're Mike Knox. Yeah, I knew your son, Jason. He was such a great guy and all that. And I said, oh, thank you. And then after they leave, we look at each other and goes, of course, Jason knew this guy. Turned out that he knew everybody. Um, much better politician than me. But, but yeah, one of the things that we... That, you know, I, I shouldn't be surprised that he wanted to be a policeman because I used to take him to the police station when I couldn't find a babysitter. And this is kind of just a little brief funny story about him. I like to brag on him even now. But um, so he was about nine years old, and I had a gangster that was, I had a warrant out for, and he got arrested on a Saturday um, or Friday morning, or Saturday, Saturday morning, about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And I got a call because you only have so many hours to, to process that prisoner before you have to let him go. So I got a call in the middle of the night about this suspect being in jail. And my wife was out of town doing some video production work. So it was just me and Jason. And I had no one to call. So I got him up and um, I took him to work with me. So he's got his Hot Wheel cars and he's sitting in my office playing with his Hot Wheel cars. I go down to the jail, get my suspect out, and I bring him up, and we're talking about the case. And, and so this guy, it was a shooting case, and there was a shotgun involved, and this and that. So I'm talking with the suspect, and all of a sudden I look up, and here comes Jason around the corner, and he looks at, he looks at this guy, and he says, you mean, now this is coming out of a nine-year-old, right? You mean you're sitting in a pickup truck, and a 12-gauge shot goes, gun goes off, and you stayed asleep? You're a liar. He's a liar, isn't he, Dad? I said, yes, he is, but you need to go play over there. Just go, you know, get out of here and go play. So I turned to this kid and I said, hey, you can't even convince a nine-year-old of that. Why don't you tell me what really happened? Well, the other guy had a gun, too, and I shot him and blah, blah, blah. I got a confession out of the guy, right? So a, a, few a few weeks go by, and I got another call like that, and my wife was home at this time, and I said, hey, sweetie, you mind if I take Jason with me? I think I can get that confession a lot quicker. <laughs> so that's where he, you know, he was around that law enforcement stuff and hung around the police station. One time I went out, I went to find him, and, and we walked out to the car, and every, every single police car on the lot that wasn't currently being used had their lights spinning. He had walked out there and turned on every single light in every car, and I'm like, oh, my God. You know, somebody's not going to, their battery's going to wear out. So we had to rustle, run through and turn all the lights off, you know. 
um, and that sort of thing. So we had a lot of fun memories together, and as he grew up, uh, uh, he got married and, and has two wonderful little children, uh, my grandchildren, and I can just tell you, I gave him the last piece of fatherly, unsolicited fatherly advice that I gave him was this. I said, Jason, I'm going to tell you how to be married for a very long time, very happily. So I'm going to share that with you all today. First thing is that remember that when you get married, if you're the guy, whatever you bring to the marriage becomes hers. When she gets married to you, whatever she has remains hers. What you acquire in your lifetime together, that's hers. So if you want to keep visiting your stuff, you need to remember three phrases. Yes, dear, I'm sorry, it's my fault. And you need to practice those three phrases so often that when she wakes you up in the middle of the night for no apparent reason, you wake up saying, yes, dear, I'm sorry, it's my fault. And he thought about it for a second. He looked at me and he said, but dad, what if it's not really my fault? I said, okay, we'll go over this again because clearly you were not listening. <laughs> yes, dear, I'm sorry, it's my fault. Uh, so that's what we do in my house and it's worked, worked for me and I'm, I'm sure it'll work for many others. Being patient is a good thing and he was a very patient guy. Um, he was into a lot of things, and I'm very, very proud of him. And thank you for mentioning him. I appreciate that. That just got us another 20 minutes on, on the show. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the funny, the little kid stories are the best, you know, but... I've got tons of stories about him, and we just, we just, uh, we miss him a lot. You know, his, the anniversary of his death is coming up here in May, and uh, this is, you know, each week that we approach that gets a little more and more difficult, so if I tear up a little bit, I'm, that's just me. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Anybody else? I can't believe nobody wanted to know about Lena Hidalgo and $11 million, or Rodney Ellis and a bunch of African art, or police stuff or anything like that. But anyway, it's my pleasure to serve. Uh, I think you asked a question about what's next for me. I don't know, honestly. Um, some people had been talking to me about running for county judge, and some people were talking to me right now about running for mayor and, and all of that, but um, I haven't, I'm not, obviously not running for county judge. Because one of the things I think that really annoys me the most about elected officials is those that get elected and then halfway through their term, decide to run for something else. It, it, that's not a servant spirit. That is picking politics as a career path, and you're looking for the next rung on the ladder kind of thing. So I refuse to do that. I, I promised the people of Houston I'd be here for four years. The first time, I promised them four years on the second time, and that's what I'm gonna do. So whatever happens for me will be happening after I finish on city council. I don't know what that's gonna be, um, but we'll see. I, I do know that I enjoy the process, I enjoy running, I enjoy the campaign, I enjoy meeting people, I enjoy helping them with their problems, um, and so forth. So I'm still young, I'll, I'll be 65 when I'm done. That's still pretty young. You know, 60's the new 40, right? And that makes 9 p.m. the new midnight, so just saying. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, thank you again for everybody for coming today. I appreciate it. And all those of you online or watching on uh, YouTube or whatever we're doing, uh, thank you all for doing that. And always be aware that, you know, your city council is here to serve you. If you can't get what you need from your district council member, your at-large council members are available too. And uh, that's what we do. So uh, uh, we're here to serve you. And we, we don't know about your problems until you tell us. So blow up my phone if you want to. There you go. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone. Good night.